Let's talk about how high altitude balloons fly, how to use burst calculators, and how to determine our maximum altitude. Our 3,000 gram balloon would start at 10 feet in diameter on the ground and expand 43 feet in diameter right before it burst at its maximum altitude. Changes in pressure can cause really violent events. Like if you put a submarine too far down in the ocean, it's going to be crushed. Water is going to beat metal. And this exploding and crushing are due to changes in pressure as the balloon moves up or the sub drops down in the ocean. Diving to the bottom of the pool can also cause an increase in pressure on the outside of your eardrums. If you've ever flown in a plane, you felt a decrease in pressure on the outside of your eardrums and it made you want to pop your ears. So whether you're at the bottom of the atmosphere or the bottom of the pool, it's going to feel like a higher pressure because it's holding up the weight of all the fluid above it. So what exactly is weight? Well, I have a mass, we're not going to say how much, but it is considerably smaller than that of the Earth. And any two objects that have mass have a gravitational attraction to each other. And the Earth's gravitational pull on me is called weight. And this is my mass times gravitational acceleration. And the reason I'm not going through the Earth's crust and towards the molten core is because the floor is pushing up on my feet with an equal and opposite force. And just as the floor pushes up on me, the lower levels of air and water are pushing on the upper levels. And to illustrate this, we can take a stack of books. And the bottom book is going to hold up all the books above it, and it's not going to be compressed by the weight of them. Just like the weight of the water, the bottom is not compressed. And a stack of pillows, on the other hand, is going to act more like air. The bottom pillow will compress under the weight of everything above it. We can also show this with using a syringe. We can add more pressure to a syringe full of water and the volume is not going to change, but the volume of a syringe full of air will change as we increase the pressure. And this is because air is compressible. The fact that air is compressible is important for two reasons. One, the pressure change of air over an altitude is a logarithmic change. And two, that this crushing of the air means that the density is changing as we're going through the atmosphere, while the pressure change of water over a depth is a linear one. The density of water would remain the same over any depth. So the balloon is flying through an atmosphere that's changing in both pressure and density. And density is the amount of stuff that there is per given volume. And there are way more air molecules per given volume down here near the ground than there are up near space. And that's because gravity is crushing the atmosphere. And 50% of all Earth's atmosphere is within the first five and a half kilometers. We built a vacuum chamber to simulate this decrease in pressure as a balloon would rise through the atmosphere. We wanted to look at a couple of different factors that might impact the balloon's flight. First, we filled a bunch of balloons with different gas mixtures and put them in the chamber. As we decreased the pressure, the balloons all expanded at the same rate. That meant that gas is not a factor in the balloon's expansion, whether it's helium or hydrogen. But the amount of gas that you put in a balloon does matter. The yellow balloon is filled with more helium than the pink one, and as we drop the pressure we can see that the yellow balloon bursts much sooner than the pink one. And that's because the pink one can expand as the pressure is decreased. So the trade-off is the more helium you put in initially, the more payload you can carry. The blue balloon has a higher initial fill volume and holds a heavier weight than the red one. So to go to a higher altitude we need a smaller fill volume, but to carry more payload we need a higher fill volume. So you might be thinking, that's fine. I'll just put in enough helium to pick up my payload. Then it will have the lowest possible fill volume it needs to get to the highest altitude. But you might have just created a floater balloon. And this is when your balloon goes really, really far away with all of your stuff. And eventually UV radiation will degrade the outside of the balloon and it will pop, but it will land somewhere probably far away from all your tracking equipment. So how does this happen? Well, we know we have a downward force called weight acting on the balloon. Gravity is pulling on the mass of the gas, the mass of the balloon, and the payload, and the ground is pushing back on the entire system. But there's another upward force that we call buoyancy, and the more you fill your balloon with helium, the more buoyancy it's going to have. And this buoyancy force is caused by a difference in pressure of an object that's submerged in a fluid like air or water. And this difference in pressure in the atmosphere is going to change your buoyancy too. And we know that the pressure at a lower position is higher than the pressure at an upper position. And the pressure on the sides of the balloons are going to cancel out. So this is going to generate an upward force. It's easier to think about the buoyancy force in terms of density and volume. And after some math, we can write this force as the volume of the displaced fluid times the density of the fluid times gravity. And the volume of the displaced fluid is the same as the volume of the object. It's just easier to think about this in terms of density. That way I don't have to calculate the differential pressure across this pool toy, I just have to know it's less dense than water, so it's going to float. 
and if we submerge it in the pool, buoyancy pushes it back upwards until it's on top of the water. The buoyancy force created by the water is greater than the weight of the float, but the float just sits on top of the water. The buoyancy force of the air is too small to overcome the weight of the foam. They both have the same volume, the same weight, and same gravity. The only difference is the density of the fluid. But let's get back to our balloon. The volume of the balloon is increasing as we're rising through the atmosphere. Since the pressure outside of the balloon is decreasing, it's less than the pressure inside of the balloon, and this difference is causing the balloon to expand outwards in order to balance out the pressures. This means our buoyancy is increasing. So why would it become stagnant? Air is compressible, and this means that our density is decreasing. So as we're going up, we're increasing our volume, which increases the buoyancy, and the decrease in density is going to lower our buoyancy. On top of that, there's another force we haven't even talked about. As we're moving, we have to deal with drag. It's a force that opposes the motion of an object in a fluid. And there are many factors to the drag force, but some of them are the faster we move, the more drag there is, or the more dense the air is, the more drag is created. So when we hit a sweet spot where drag has slowed our balloon down enough, then only forces we have to deal with are weight and buoyancy, and they've balanced out, and the wind just kind of takes your balloon off wherever it wants to go. Now that we know how the balloon flies, we can look at some prediction software so you don't have to do any of the math. It's going to do it all for you. HabHub is one of the most popular predictors out there, and I also love them because they published a paper and they shared their code so we can know how they made their calculations. So they ask you for your payload mass in grams, and you can pick from balloon sizes of some of the most popular vendors. The balloons are sold in gram sizes, and the vendor should tell you also the burst diameter and the neck diameter. The neck diameter is going to help you when you're building your fill station. Pro tip, make sure that the fill station has a tight fit. On ridiculously windy days, duct tape might not even save you. HabHub has hard-coded the mass, burst diameters, and drag coefficients of known balloons. If you get a balloon from a different vendor, you just need to pick the appropriate mass. You go down to the advanced tab, and then you can check the burst diameter box. And you should put it in the vendor's diameter value for your balloon. You can also put in your own drag coefficient, or you can leave it as the default. And the default gas is helium, but if you're using a different gas, you can just enter that gas's density. Then you need to pick either a target burst altitude or a target ascent rate. If you have cameras or certain scientific payloads, you might have a specific ascent rate in mind. When picking these values, the program could give you one of two error messages. It could say that you can't achieve that altitude in this configuration. This means that your balloon is too small and will burst at an altitude much lower than the one that you want. It will also tell you if you have a floater configuration. Either target value you pick is going to return a burst altitude, an ascent rate, a time to burst, a neck lift value, and a volume. Let's look at what these values are and how the code calculates them. The first item calculated is the volume value. This is the initial fill volume that your balloon needs. If you pick a burst altitude as your target value, the code takes the known burst diameter from the manufacturer and determines the volume of the balloon at burst. We have a logarithmic equation that determines how pressure is changing over the altitude. If we take the ideal gas equation and rearrange this, we can find our fill volume. The H value in this equation is what HabHub calls the air density model. This is in the advanced tab, but most other places I've seen call it the scale height. It's a number between 7,000 kilometers and 8,000 kilometers, and unless you know it for your location, I would just leave it as the default value. If you choose a target ascent rate, the code says that there's no acceleration. This means that you're moving at a constant ascent rate. The drag is equal to the buoyancy minus the weight. Then rearranging the terms, you can solve for the initial fill volume. If you have a flow meter on your gas tank, you can use this to calculate when your balloon has reached the proper fill volume. If you don't have a flow meter, you can just use the neck lift value. This is the mass that your balloon needs to lift off the ground in order to achieve your burst altitude or your ascent rate. And when you're searching for information on high altitude balloons, sites will say neck lift, gross lift, nozzle lift, and all other kinds of lift. And you need to know what equations they're talking about and what units they're using. Sometimes the units might be in mass and sometimes they might be a force value. And when you set the burst altitude as your target, the code rearranges this for the free lift and then solves for the ascent rate of the balloon. If the ascent rate was your original target value, then the code uses that logarithmic equation to solve for burst altitude. And then finally, the code divides the burst altitude by the ascent rate to get the time of flight. This is a great approximation of the flight of a balloon, but it makes many simplifications and assumptions. The yellow graph is the flight calculations made by HabHub, and the white graph is calculations made by a program called Astra. And the problem is that HabHub uses 
algebra, and Astra uses calculus. So Astra takes in variations of the atmosphere, changes in buoyancy, weather, changes in drag, and creates a probabilistic map. And I don't have a copy of their code, but they did post a research paper for their software. Understanding the code for HabHub and running hundreds of Astra simulations really helped me figure out the proper fill volume for our balloon because we needed it to be both in a smooth part of the atmosphere during the total solar eclipse of 2017, and we wanted to catch as much of the eclipse as possible. So we needed a non-floater balloon that would ascend to the highest altitude, and, well, I mean, at least that was a plan. Because our 3,000 gram balloon kind of flew away and we didn't have enough helium left for another giant balloon, but we did use a backup small 800 gram balloon. And I had to figure out how much weight to cut off and a whole new launch window for the balloon. And we got it off just in time. And that software also predicted the proper landing zone. So I hope these softwares help you with any projects that you're working on. Please send us pictures of them on Twitter, or you can tell us about them in the comments down below. Thank you guys so much for learning with us today, and we'll see you next time.